right, everybody, welcome once again to the CUNY Set Theory Seminar. Today, we have Jonathan Asinski back giving a talk. He spoke at the seminar last year. Jonathan, it's great to have you. Um, Jonathan is currently at the University of Hamburg, and he will uh, talk about model theory of class size logics. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll talk about model theory of well, class logics, and by this I kind of mean um, logics that if you look at the collection of sentences over some set size vocabulary, then this collection actually forms a proper class. Um, and well, most of what I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Trevor Wilson. And actually, one of those results I already mentioned exactly a year ago when I when I gave the last talk here in the CUNY seminar. So maybe this is, um, yeah, maybe this is a good um, continuation of that. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to start by talking a bit about kind of the other case, logics that are not class-sized, um, to kind of motivate the class logics a bit. So, um, yeah, let's maybe start by saying, so we look at abstract logics. Um, so it could be first order logic, second order, second order logic, infinitary logics, or logics that have some quantifiers added. Um, and to do it a bit more formally, um, yeah, a logic L is has two components. The first thing is kind of a class function that takes a vocabulary tau and returns some such just some collection of objects L of tau and those we interpret as the tau sentences of L. And then it has some relation that can hold between tau structures and those sentences in L of tau. And well, this is, we interpret as the satisfaction relation. So we say if some structure A is in this relation to some object phi, we think uh, A satisfies phi. And then we also want that this kind of adheres to some niceness properties. So for example, that if we have isomorphic structures, that those things are um, models of exactly the same sentences and some others. And one that is often included in the definition of a logic is um, that, yeah, that attention is focused on logics that are actually essentially set-sized objects. So this is this notion of a logic is set presentable. And this has usually two components. First of all, for a set size vocabulary tau, this collection of L sentences over tau actually forms a set. And second, the logic has an occurrence number, which is some cardinal kappa such that basically any sentence of the logic depends on less than kappa non-logical symbols. So if phi is in L of tau for some vocabulary tau, then there's some less than kappa size subset of tau such that phi is already a sentence over that less than kappa size subset. Um, okay, and this actually has already some, like assuming this of a logic already has some effects on its model theoretic properties. And maybe let's look at two, two properties that this has an effect on. Um, first of all, the Hanf number of a logics. So that is the smallest cardinal kappa, such that any sentence of the logic that has a model of at least size kappa also has arbitrarily large models. So this is kind of a generalization of the upwards Löwenheim Skolem theorem for just arbitrary logics. Yeah. And um, the second property is kind of the kind of the opposite of this, the Löwenheim Skolem number. So the generalization of the downwards Löwenheim Skolem theorem. Uh, that's the smallest cardinal kappa, such as any satisfiable sentence of the logic has a model of size less than kappa. And then Hanf, who introduced this Hanf number, um, actually proved, I'm not sure if he proved the thing about the Lovenheim Skolem number, uh, this might also be just some kind of folklore, uh, but he proved this result about a Hanf number that every of those set presentable logics actually has, has such a Hanf number. Um, and the proof is rather easy, so I'll show it here. Um, so first of all, 
let kappa be this occurrence number of L and then note to analyze L sentences, it's sufficient to just consider vocabularies tau in H kappa. Yeah. Um, and then consider the following first kind of collection of cardinals. So for every uh, vocabulary tau in H kappa and every sentence phi in L of tau, um, and uh, such that phi does not have arbitrarily uh, large models, kind of look at the uh, the cardinalities of models the sentence actually has. And well, because L of tau is actually a, a set in this in this case, because we assume that the logic is set presentable, um, this here actually forms a set of cardinals. So it has some supremum. Um, and yeah, let's call this cardinal lambda. And this is then actually a Hanf number because, well, if if a logic has some sentence larger than this, then, well, it will be a model of the sentence that, well, does have arbitrarily uh, model, uh, that does have models of arbitrary size. And the Lewenheim Skolheim number, the proof kind of goes similar. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. But now let's, let's switch to the class logics. And um, the most important example is this L infinity infinity, um, which we kind of uh, define by first looking at L kappa kappa for cardinal kappa. And this is just uh, first, this is like first order logic, just that we uh, expand uh, the, fo the formula formation rules by clauses that allow us to build um, less than kappa sized conjunctions and disjunctions. And if we have less than uh, like a sequence of less than gamma many variables, we allow like a formula that says there is this uh, sequence of variables phi for some formula phi. So yeah, this is first order logic, but added um, less than kappa length conjuncts and disjunctions and less than kappa lengths universal and existential quantifiers. And the satisfaction relation is defined in the obvious, obvious way. So like, for example, it's a model of this big wedge tau um, uh, T if and only if, um, well, it's a model of all the formulas in this set of formulas T. Um, and then L infinity infinity is just the collection of, well, all formulas that are in any L kappa kappa, yeah? Okay, and well, so maybe, yeah, what I want to say first is this doesn't really have any interesting model theory, this logic, because, well, if you think about what one would want to do is say you have some structure A and um, usually you would want to maybe look at the theory of that structure in some logic L and then look at kind of how do the models of the theory look like. Um, but in this logic, it's quite easy to see that you can actually just give one sentence that defines any structure up to isomorphism. So the models of the theory of that structure will just be the structure itself. Because like all the, yeah, all the structures are isomorphic to that structure. So this is not really interesting. Um, in particular, this also shows that um, L infinity infinity does neither have a Lewenheim Skolheim number nor a Hanf number. But I actually want to give like a, a different proof than this because I want to point out a few things, um, like for like considering this proof. Okay, like first of all, why doesn't it have a Lewenheim Skolheim number? Like. This is because for any cardinal kappa, we can form this formula here. There is some sequence of objects indexed by ordinals smaller than kappa, such that all those objects are different. So this says that this is true in a model if and only if the model has a size at least kappa. So this why, it, yeah, so this shows um, that infinity, infinity cannot have an LS number. And on the other hand, we can also express then that a model has size less than kappa, namely by saying um, for every 
yeah, sequence of elements of the object, two of them have to be the same like for kappa many things. So this basically says there's no injection from um, kappa into the model. Okay, and now what I want to pinpoint you to is notice that the first expression only uses existential quantifiers and uh, um, and infinitary conjunctions, while the second one only uses uh, universal quantified and quantifiers and infinitary disjunctions. And now. Um, what we will see is that if you actually drop one of those pairs, so if you drop universal, like infinitary universal quantifiers and um, infinitary disjunctions, you can have Hanf numbers. And if you drop um, ex, um, infinitary existential quantifiers and um, conjunctions, you can have Lunam Skolam numbers. Okay, so maybe let's look at one of those logics. So I kind of suggestively call this L disjunction infinity universal quantifier infinity. So this shall indicate that this is the uh, infinitary logic that only has infinitary disjunctions and infinitary universal quantifiers, but no infinitary conjunctions and inter infinitary um, existential quantifiers. So yeah. This is what those two items say here. And then third, um, we demand that every any sentence of this logic here is in negation normal form so that the, the negations are pushed to the most inside, like and can only stand in front of atomic formulas to avoid that. Like if we, if we don't have this, we would be able to define the existential quantifier and the the uh, conjunctions by yeah by looking at the dual of yeah as as a dual of uh, a universal quantifier or a um, disjunction yeah okay and then uh, Trevor Wilson showed that uh, the LST number which is kind of a stronger version of this Lovenam Spolem number we already looked at of this logic here is the first super compact cardinal. Um, Okay, and what I want to do now is kind of um, look at the dual of this logic. So I want to now look at the well, the logic that has that has uh, infinitary conjunctions and existential quantifiers, but is not allowed to have any infinitary disjunctions or universal quantifiers. And again, all the sentences are negation normal form to avoid that we can define the second batch by the first one if we would have. Yeah, if we if we wouldn't have this condition. Okay, and kind of the first, um, so yeah, I kind of already mentioned this. This can have Hanf numbers, but um, yeah. So the thing is, um, if you have compactness properties, it's easy to see that you also have those upwards Lovenam Skolem theory um, properties. Like if you think back of how you would prove the um, the upwards Lovenam Skolem theory in first order logic. Um, if you have, like, you would, you have some theory, you add a bunch of constants, and you say that they all have to interpret differently, and then, like, every finite subset of this theory is satisfiable, so you find, like, a large model of this theory. Um, so, yeah, I, I mostly want to talk about compactness numbers, which implies those Hans numbers that we talked about earlier. So, what is a compactness number? The compactness number of a logic is the smallest cardinal kappa, such that if we look at any theory, and theories are also always set sized, um, of which any less than kappa set subset is satisfiable, this theory should have a model. Yeah. Okay. And um, what we will show is that the compactness number of this logic is actually omega. And we do this by showing that. We can actually lift, um, like we, yeah, we can we can kind of do the uh, proof of the compactness theorem of first order logic um, by um, by ultra products, 
um, for this logic. So, and for what we need for this is that we can lift some of Wash's theorem to this logic. And this is what I want to do now. Um, look at this lemma. Um, let U be an ultra filter on some set I and MI a bunch of structures and phi some sentence of this logic. And now um, to formulate this properly, we we want to allow that this is actually a formula and not a, a sentence, but um, maybe let's, if we have a formula, then we, we need some variable assignments to actually evaluate the sentence, but let's ignore that maybe for a second. So what we want to show is if the set of all I and I, such as M I is a model of phi is in this ultra filter, then the ultra product of those uh, structures is a model of phi. Yeah, so this is kind of an, yeah, this is exactly one direction of Wash's theorem. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of want to give you a short proof. Um, we can show this by induction on phi. If phi is a negated atomic formula or an atomic formula, then this is just the definition of the ultra product. And well, if we have finite, like we also allow finitary disjunctions and universal quantifiers, those steps are just exactly the steps from Wash's theorem. Yeah. So the interesting steps are uh, the infinite uh, conjunction and the infinite existential quantifiers. So what happens if it, we have an infinite conjunction? So if phi is, uh, yeah, the conjunction over some set of formulas S. Yeah. Um, so we assume that the set of all I and I such that M I is a model of um, this conjunction is in U. Well, then, because for for any psi in S, um, this set here is a superset of this one. So the set of all I and I such that M I is a model of psi is a superset of the set of all I and I such that M I is a model of the conjunction. Um, well, this is also in U. And then by induction hypothesis, this uh, ultra product is a model of psi. So we showed that the ultra product is actually a model of the conjunction. Um, yeah, and maybe maybe let's, so we only have this one direction here of Wash's theorem. We don't have the backwards direction. And maybe let's let's think about for a second why this doesn't work. So if we would want the backwards direction, so we would assume this here, that the ultra product is a, is a model of the um, conjunction, we would still get that, um, set of all i and i such that m i is a model of psi is in u for all the psi but now to conclude that um, this set here is in u we would want that the intersection of all those things is in u but well s can be a set of any size so we would need kind of an ultra filter that is like if we want this for any set we would need an ultra filter that is arbitrarily uh, closed or arbitrarily complete so we don't have that um, so this is why we only get this one direction here. Okay, and then um, on the next slide, I actually have the existential quantifier case, but actually this is, this is first of all, a bit annoying to present because we have those, we need to look at those um, variable assignments here. And actually this is basically works the same way as in the finite case. So I'm I'm gonna skip this, yeah? So, what we have is uh, we have kind of one direction of Wash's theorem for this for formulas of this logic, and um, this is enough to show that um, yeah, this logic is actually fully compact, like it has compactness number omega, like first order logic as well. So that shows us. So this is really just exactly the uh, ultra product proof of the compactness theorem. But let's just do it. Um, so let T be some finitely satisfiable theory. So every finite subset of this has some model. So um, yeah, um, we take some fine ultra filter on the finite subsets of T. So that means for every fine T, the set of all uh, finite subsets of T such as phi and S is in U. And we can fix a model M S of S for every S in this index set. And now, because if phi is an S, MS is a model of phi, uh, this is actually a superset of this. And we assume that all those are in U. So, um, well, this set is in U for any phi and T. 
And then our watch like lemma just tells us the ultra product of all the MS is a model of, well, phi for any phi. So it's a model of T. Okay, so this kind of shows us, yeah, I don't know. In, in some sense, I think this is a bit surprising because usually, um, I mean, the proof is more or less trivial, but um, usually compactness numbers of extension of first order logic gives us some kind of large cardinals often. But here we have this like very kind of large logic with those class many sentences, but we still have compactness number like first order logic omega. Um, okay. Now I want to talk about, um, well, second order logic um, with infinitary conjunctions and infinitary existential quantifiers. And um, first of all, I want to talk a bit about um, how properties of finitary second order logic relate to extendable cardinals. So extendable cardinals are some large cardinal notion. The cardinal kappa is extendable if for every alpha larger than kappa, there is some ordinal beta and some elementary embedding from the alpha to v beta, such that its critical point is kappa. And well, we can equivalently equivalently adjoin the condition that j of kappa always has to be sent above alpha. This is equivalent. Um, like globally, this is equivalent. And um, there's the following theorem that kind of relates um, second order logic or properties of second order logic to extendable cardinals. So this equivalence here was shown by Magidor already in the 70s, so this is quite old. Um, first extendable cardinal is exactly the compactness number of second order logic. And then um, uh, members of different subset of the set containing Wilboni, Vika, Yaya Hayut, and myself um, have independently shown that um, the first extendable cardinal is also the uh, upwards Löwenheim Skolem Tarski number of second order logic. And this is kind of a stronger version of the Hanf number. Um, namely, it's the following cardinal. So the ULST number of some logic is the smallest cardinal kappa such that if we have some structure phi that has size at least kappa, there are arbitrarily large superstructures of uh, A that are also that also satisfy phi. Um, yeah, so the superstructure um, is the addition that distinguishes this from the Hanf number, and this actually makes it have some large cardinal strengths. Yeah. Um, and now we show the following theorem. Um, the following are equivalent for a cardinal kappa. Again, kappa is the first extent of the cardinal. Then kappa is the compactness number of the second order logic with infinitary conjunctions and existential quantifiers. Kappa, then kappa is the weak compactness number of this logic. I'll I say in a second what that is. Um, kappa is the ULST number of that logic and kappa is the Hanf number of that logic. And well, the, the weak compactness number is just kind of um, like what is known from like how you define weakly compact cardinals. So um, for, the, for the compactness number, um, any theory that is less than kappa satisfiable has to have a model. And for the weak of compactness number, uh, any theory of exactly size kappa that is less than kappa satisfiable has to have a, has to have a model. Um, Okay, and so I want to compare this a bit to the last theorem we had. Um, so in some sense, this is a bit similar, right? Um, we have that the um, compactness number of first order logic is omega, and um, also all these, like by that fact, also all these other numbers here of first order logic are omega. And then when we added uh, this, those infinitary conjunctions and existential quantifiers, we notice that the compactness number and all those other numbers just stay the same. They stay omega, yeah? And here, this is partly also true. Like 
the um, compactness number of finitary second order logic and the ULST number of finite sec finitary second order logic is the first extendable cardinal. But if we add um, infinitary conjunctions and existential quantifiers, this just still holds true. This is still the first extendable cardinal. But now for the Hanf number and the weak compactness number, this is different because we saw in the beginning the Hanf number of second order logic that this exists is, is a ZFC result. Um, but that the Hanf number of, well, this infinitary second order logic exists now actually is equivalent to this large cardinal assumption. And similar, the existence of, a, of the weak compactness number of finitary second order logic by some result of Philip Lücke, um, this, this isn't be like you cannot show the, the, the its existence in ZFC, but um, it has strengths well, like much weaker than an extendable cardinal, like below a measurable cardinal. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, for for those two properties, adding those um, those infinitary bits of second order logic actually increases the the strength of those properties by a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually want to give a proof. Um, yeah, so we start by showing that, so one implies two, it's like property three, four, and five are all weaker than two. So it's sufficient to show that one implies two and that three implies one and five implies one. Um, okay, so let's take some theory of this logic that is less than kappa satisfiable. You notice because well, T like even though this is this class logic, T um, T is a set of sentences, so T is actually a subset of well second order logic with conjunctions uh, and existential quantifiers smaller than lambda for some cardinal lambda. Yeah. Um, okay. Now by extendability, take. Like we first take some cardinal alpha that is large enough to contain lambda kappa, the cardinal D of T, and T itself. And then by extendability, we find some ordinal beta and elementary bedding from V alpha to V beta that is critical point kappa and sends J of kappa above A. And now, well, the image of T is now something small in this in this uh, model beta, it's, it's smaller than, um, yeah, there's something small in this model beta. So the beta thinks this has a model. And yeah, we want to now show that this model B is actually a model of T itself. Um, so what we, what we want to show for this is, so if phi is any sentence of this logic, then if the beta thinks that B is a model of J of phi, then B is a model of phi. And we have some variable assignments going on here. That we will ignore this in the proof. Um, okay, so we want to show this by induction on phi. Again, the negated atomic case and the atomic case and the finitary cases are mostly straightforward. Um, so let's look at what happens if this is actually an infinitary conjunction. Yeah. Um, and maybe what I want to point out is, so usually if you if you prove something like this and say this is finitary second order logic, then that V beta thinks that um, J point where the limit of T has a model B, like just immediately implies that B is a model of T. Because if phi is some finitary sentence of first order logic, then applying J to phi doesn't do anything with phi really, because, well, phi is some object that lives like below this critical point kappa. But what can happen now is because we, we have um, like conjunctions of arbitrary length. Um, so say we have here some phi that is the conjunction of I smaller gamma of formulas xi i, this, this gamma doesn't have to be some small cardinal. It can be something very large, yeah? Uh, so in, like it can be larger than the critical point of the embedding. So applying J to this phi actually changes this to a, to a different formula. 
Um, so let's do this. Let's apply J to phi. Then we get um, some formula. Well, some con this is like in, in V beta, this is some conjunction indexed by J of gamma of formulas psi i star. Um, okay. But, well, um, if we con consider any of those chi i, then we know that j of chi i is actually chi j of i star. And because v beta is a model of this conjunction here, v beta, uh, b, 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 v beta thinks b is a model of this conjunction, v beta also thinks that b is a model of uh, chi j i star. And then just induction hypothesis tells us that b is a model of chi i. So that means B is a model of all the chi i. So B is a model of this um, big conjunction. Um, yeah, and now maybe similarly to the kind of what we did in the wash proof, um, let's think about maybe what happens. So so why does this work for the conjunctions, but not for the disjunctions? Yeah, so the same theorem here doesn't work if we use infinitary disjunctions. Um, and well, this is because, well, if phi here would be a, would be a disjunction, then j of phi would be the disjunction over indexed by j of gamma of chi i star. And then v beta would think like b is a model of this disjunction. So there would be one of those uh, chi i star, chi i star that v beta thinks b is a model of. But we wouldn't know that this is actually an image of the ones that um, we actually care about of the of the chi i's. So this is why we wouldn't be able to conclude that B is actually a model of this disjunction. This would be a disjunction. So this is why this works for con conjunctions and not for disjunctions. Um, okay. And again on the next slide I have the proof for the for the um, for the existential quantifier case, but this is really just straightforward. You can, if you want, you can write this down. It's, there's nothing going on there, really. Okay, so, well, this shows, so V beta thinks that B is a model of J of phi for all the phi in, uh, for all the phi and T. So B is a model of phi for all phi and T. So B is a model of T. Okay. Good. Um, and now for the other directions, uh, I first need this lemma here. Um, so Magidor divides some sentence. This is usually known as Magidor's phi, which is like a finitary second order sentence, um, which basically defines the stages of the cumulative hierarchy. So there, there is a sentence phi of second order logic such that some model M E is a model of phi if and only if there's some limit ordinal alpha such that M E is isomorphic to the alpha. Okay, and this this we'll use. So now we assume that um, kappa is a weak compactness cardinal for this infinitary second order logic, and we want to show that there's an extendable cardinal below kappa. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this proof will kind of make a bit clearer of what we can actually do in this logic. Um, so yeah, we have to show extendability of some of some cardinal below below kappa. So let alpha larger than kappa be an ordinal, and we want to produce some elementary embedding from v alpha to v beta with critical point yeah. at most kappa. So first take some let let gamma be the size of the alpha and take some enumeration ai indexed by gamma of the alpha, and just assume that we start with a zero equal in kappa. Um, then take some constant symbol C and now look at the following sentence, which is a sentence of our logic. Um, so there is a sequence of variables bi, i indexed by gamma, um, which satisfy the following conjunction. And now this conjunction is basically just a conjunction of all the formulas that appear in the elementary diagram of the alpha. Yeah. So for all I1 through n smaller than gamma, if um, the formula phi of ai1 through aiN, where, where the ai1 through aiN are, um, well, elements of the alpha from this list here, um, for all those I plug in the form, for all those that are actually in the elementary diagram of the alpha, I plug in the 
formula that phi holds of the variables bi1 through bin. And I also want that b0 gets interpreted as this constant symbol c. OK, now if m is a model of psi, and well, this bim is a sequence of elements of m satisfying this formula, then, well, sending ai to bim is an elementary embedding because the bim satisfies this elementary diagram. OK, so, so what I can do in this logic is kind of I can um, write down the elementary diagram of any structure in one formula. And this allows us to uh, write down this theory here. So, so look at the theory consisting of psi, this uh, Magidor sentence phi that we looked at in the slide before. And then, uh, well, this is a, this is an addition of like uh, formulas that tell us that the constant C gets interpreted by some ordinal uh, that has order type at least kappa plus one. Yeah. Um, okay, now if we have a model of T, this is of the form M equals V beta by, by the usage of this Magido sentence phi. Um, it satisfies the sentence psi. So again, if we have the sequence BIM that satisfies this formula, AI sending AI to BIM is an elementary embedding. And by this part of the theory, this elementary embedding has critical point at most kappa. So yeah, what we need is that this theory is satisfiable. Yeah, and now we can use our assumption three. Kappa is a weak compactness cardinal for this for this logic. Um, T is a is a theory of size kappa, and well, we can satisfy any less than kappa size subset just by using the alpha and interpreting those constant here accordingly. Like we just take like less than kappa many different co constants and interpret them properly. So yeah, using three, T has a model. Okay, um, regarding time, I think I wanna skip this proof. Um, yeah, that the Hanf number also implies that um, there is an extendable cardinal. Um, so yeah, this ends then the proof of of the theorem here. Okay. Um, and what I want to do now is go to some kind of um, kind of um, like maybe I'm not quite sure new compactness property. And with this property, we are actually able to um, characterize Schellach cardinals. Um, so the following equi are equivalent for some cardinal kappa. Kappa is a Schellach cardinal. So that means for all functions f from kappa to kappa, there is an elementary embedding from b to m that has critical point kappa and such that m is closed under, or vj of f of kappa is contained in m. So, sorry. And this is equivalent to the following. Um, kappa is inaccessible. And if t is a theory in this logic, I'll say something about this in a second. Um, so T is a theory of size kappa, and every less than kappa size subset of T has a model of size smaller than kappa, then T has a model. So this is kind of a, this is like the weak compactness cardinal, but we don't demand that every uh, less than kappa size subset of T has any model, but we want that every less than kappa size subset of T has a model of size smaller than kappa. Okay, and uh, what I what I do here is um, now my notation gets gets a bit long, but so now we have arbitrary conjunctions, arbitrary existential quantifiers, and then disjunctions of size smaller than kappa and universal quantifiers of size smaller than kappa. Huh? Okay, um, and to prove this, we um, Yeah. Um, yeah, to prove this, we need something that is called P structures. Um, P structures are kind of 
um, well, an alternative to to extenders. So, I mean, by extenders, we we want to um, uh, we want to like have some set size uh, object that codes uh, like an elementary embedding from V to from V to some class M. Yeah. And well, usually extenders are of course like um, sequences of coherent ultra filters kind of. Um, and here we look at some kind of uh, alternative, yeah, alternative structures that can do the same things. And those are known as, as P structures. Um, the definition I'm giving here is due to, to Trevor. Um, I'm, I'm not actually quite sure about the history of this notion. Like there are similar things done by Neiman and Zeman before, but like this particular version of this was from paper of Trevor. Um, so if X is some transitive set, a P structure is a structure that has that, that lives on the power set of the uh, set of finite uh, sequences from X. And then it has a bunch of um, yeah, a bunch of operations going on on it. Uh, and I'm just going to go through a few of them, uh, through a few of them. Um, yeah, we have intersection of those sets. We have complementation. We have like this constant that just has all the uh, all the sequences of length, of length exactly k for some natural number k. Um, we have this, um, yeah, we have kind of a unary predicate WF such that uh, WF contains precisely all the A in the power set of X is less than omega, which don't have any infinite ascending chains. And then there are like these two complicated properties that I, that I don't want to go into here now because it would be, that would be too technical, that's a bit too technical for that. Um, basically, um, so I said we want that those structures, um, yeah, kind of code elementary em embeddings from V to some model M. Um, and like usually in extenders, we have like properties of well foundedness, coherence, uh, normality, and those predicates here kind of uh, correspond to this. So it's WF suggestively named corresponds to well-foundedness. This corresponds to um, coherence. This corresponds to normality. And so, uh, so how does it work that those P structures uh, code elementary embeddings? So it's, it's actually not the P structures that themselves that do it. It's homomorphisms between P structures. Yeah. So a map H from the power set of X to the less than omega to the power set of Y to the less than omega um, is called a homomorphism of P structures, if and only if it's just a homomorphism of those structures here in the usual sense. So say, for example, H of A intersected B is, uh, yeah, the intersection of H of A with H of B, or if a is in WF of the first structure, H of A is in WF of the second structure. So this is really just a homomorphism. And now we have the following theorem. Um, if X and Y are transitive sets and H from PX to PY is a homomorphism, then there is some transitive class M and an elementary embedding J from V to M, such that Y is contained in J of X and H of A equals J of A intersected Y to the less than omega for all a in x is less than omega. So that means if we have a homomorphism, we can get actually an elementary embedding out of this. Yeah, and here that y is contained in j of x and h of a equals j of a intersected y to less than omega kind of shows how, how the elementary embedding is related to the homomorphism. And the other way around, also if we have an elementary embedding from b to m, then for all transitive X and Y such that uh, Y is covered by J of X, this map here where A gets sent to J of A intersected Y to the less than omega actually is a homomorphism of P structures. Yeah, 
So in this sense, those are an alternative to extenders. Yeah. So having a homomorphism gives us a particular um, yeah, elementary embedding of V2 sum M, and having such an elementary embedding gives us such a homomorphism. Okay. And now um, what we want to see is that um, this logic that we're interested in can actually um, kind of hard code that there is an isomorphisms from some given structure into the structure that um, yeah, so yeah, that satisfies the sentence that uh, that claims that there is this this homomorphism. So what do I mean by this? Um, if f is some function from kappa to kappa, then there is a sentence psi in this logic such that any transitive m, which is closed under finite sequences, and any functions from the ordinals of m to the ordinals of m then M is a model of Psi if and only if there is some uh, homomorphism of P-structures um, from the P-structure on the kappa to this M, such that H of uh, the function F is this F of M, and H of some ordinal alpha um, is just alpha intersected with M for all the alpha in the kappa. Okay, and... Well, how, how does it look like? Um, first of all, what we need, this is what we need this um, these disjunctions and universal quantifiers for. For beta smaller than kappa, there's a formula of that logic that actually defines beta. Yeah, So in such that in any transitive set, phi, like say n, n uh, is a model of phi beta of some element x, if and only if x is actually beta. Yeah, So we can define any ordinal smaller than kappa in this logic. And now we take psi as the following sentence. So um, we, we make like an existential quantification about um, variables x, a for every a in, well, the power set of v kappa to the less than omega, so the uh, the set that this p structure lives on. Um, so for all those, we take one, this is supposed to be a second order variable xa, and then we just add sentences that tell us, uh, well, how those xa should behave according to how the a behave in this p structure on v kappa. Yeah, so for every, uh, for all sets a, b, and c in the power set of the kappa to the less than omega, such as a intersected b equals c, we add the formula x a intersected x b is x c. And similar, maybe for this well-foundedness thing, for all the a that are in this in this uh, that I mentioned earlier in this uh, well-founded predicate on the p structure v kappa, uh, we add a sentence that x a also should be well founded. So for all y such that, uh, so this is a formula expressing that like if y is any non-empty subset of x a, then z has to have some uh, kind of yeah element that is yeah maximal in this in this uh, extension relation of of finite sequences. Um, then how do we get this h of f equals fm? Well, we just add a sentence that says, well, the um, yeah the function f of x y um, like f of x equals y if and only if the the uh, the elements x and y are in the variable that interprets this function. And similar, we do this with um, all the alpha smaller kappa to get h of alpha equals alpha and m. And then we had similar formulas for this complement and the other two uh, other predicates we have uh, on this v kappa. And then if we have a model that uh, is a model of the sentence, then, well, it will have some uh, sequence of like subsets witnessing like this formula here. And then 
sending a set A to the interpretation of this variable will be our homomorphism. And this, like in the sentence, we just exactly um, describe how all the uh, subsets of A behave to each other in this P structure. So this is why this, this is a homomorphism. Okay, and with this, we can prove our um, our theorem here. And so the direction two to one. So we want to, to show that kappa is shallow. So we have some uh, function f from kappa to kappa. Um, and without loss of generality, we can assume that this is increasing. Yeah, and uh, we want to produce this elementary embedding. So what we do is we take constant c alpha for alpha less or equal than kappa, and then we look at the following theory, theory T. We use the sentence psi that um, that we had in the, in the lemma before that says, uh, that quotes this existence of a, of a homomorphism. Uh, we add this Magidor's phi again, and then we add, um, well, this, this part of the theory tells us um, that there is a, ordinal of order type at least kappa in this in any model of this theory yeah so if m is a model of t um by using magidor's phi we have that m is v delta um for some delta because we have an ordinal of order type at least kappa delta has to be larger than kappa and this psi tells us there is a homomorphism h from the p structure on v kappa to the p structure on v delta, such that h of our function f is this function fm, and h of alpha equals alpha for all alpha smaller than kappa. Okay, um, now um, by this kind of theorem that tells us how homomorphisms of p structures relate to um, Relate to elementary embeddings, we get an elementary embedding from V to M such that V delta is uh, covered by J of V kappa and such that H of A equals J of A intersected V delta to the less than omega for all the elements of our P structure. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, by this, we know that J of kappa is at least by this, like, because J of kappa covers V delta, we know that J of kappa is greater or equal than delta. Um, and delta was larger than kappa. So J of kappa is larger than kappa. And um, then, yeah, we know that J of alpha equals H of alpha for all alpha smaller than kappa, and H of alpha was alpha. So um, for alpha smaller than kappa, J of alpha is alpha. So that means the critical point is actually kappa. So what is missing now is that V J of F of kappa is a subset of M. Yeah. Um, this again follows from this um well, this property here that we know what how H of A and J of A relate for for subsets of V kappa is less than omega. Yeah. Uh, we know that. Um, this function fm equals h of f. This came from, from the lemma before. And we know that h of f equals j of f intersected v delta. So this means that j of f of kappa actually is fm of kappa. And because fm of kappa was a function from the ordinals in v delta to the ordinals in v delta, we know that fm of kappa has to be smaller than delta. Yeah, so what we get is that j of f of kappa is smaller than delta, and this v j of f of kappa is a subset of v delta, and this is a subset of uh, j of v kappa, as we already know, and well, this is a subset of m. So this is, yeah, this shows that our Schellach condition is, is satisfied. Okay, so what we have left is to show that t is satisfiable, and well, what we need is we have to show that any uh, theory, uh, sub-theory T0 of T of size smaller than kappa has a model of size smaller than kappa. This was this, um, yeah, this was the assumption that we that we had on, on the logic. Um, so take some closure point of the, of our function F, and then 
Well, in T0 will appear maximally gamma different ordinals, um, uh, different constants that uh, have to be interpreted by different ordinals. Um, and well, because we can just choose eta larger than gamma, we can like, interpret those uh, ordinals in eta accordingly. Yeah, so that this fits with this, th with this theory we have. Um, and now, yeah, this needs now a bit of work. So it's it's rather easy to see that um, if we have some A from our P structure on V kappa, that if we just intersect it with V eta, and notice that V eta is, um, is a subset of kappa, then this is actually homomorphism. It's it's hard, it's easy to just yeah, check all the check for all the um relations, et cetera, that we have in the P structure that this goes through. Um, so that this is homomorphism means that um, that V eta is actually a model of our sentence psi, which was exactly coding that there is such a homomorphism. Yeah. So and overall this this means that V eta with F restricted to eta and then those ordinals interpreted in an appropriate way. This is a model of T0. And because we assume kappa is inaccessible uh, and v eta, so eta is smaller than kappa, we have that v eta is smaller than kappa. So this is a model of size smaller than kappa. And then our, our property of the logic gives us that T is actually satisfied. Okay, that's the proof. Um, good. And now what I wanna do for the rest of the talk is I actually wanna go a bit away from the class logics and kind of look at the opposite end of logics, namely logics that don't have any infinitary means at all. Um, and well, this is like what we want to do with that. So I want to I want to look at Vopenka's principle. So Vopenka's principle is the axiom scheme that in any definable class of structures K, um, of stru structures in the same vocabulary, they are to a and B and K and some and such that there's a non-trivial elementary embedding from A to B. And this is actually um, like an axiom scheme that is quite important in model theory of strong logics um, because this is equivalent to um, yeah a few yeah it's equivalent to the following things. So first of all, this, this was shown by Stavi, I think in the late 70s, Wopinger's principle is equivalent to every of those set presentables, so not, not class logic, every set presentable logic has an LST number. Then in the, in the 80s, Markovsky showed that every set presentable logic has a compactness number is also equivalent to Wopinger's principle. And then recently, again, different subsets of Wilboni, Vika, and myself showed that this is also equivalent to every set presentable logic has a ULST number. Okay, so what this kind of means is that Wopenka's principle is somewhat of an upper bound in the large cardinal hierarchy on kind of how far we can get with those properties of logics. Yeah. Um, and well, then the question is kind of, can we, can we find some properties of logics that have large cardinal strength stronger than Wopenka's principle? And well, the, the answer is yes. And there are different ways people have done this. Um, so first of all, um, yeah, let's look at huge cardinals for a second. So a cardinal kappa is huge at lambda if there is an elementary embedding j from v to m such so that the critical point is kappa j of kappa is exactly lambda and uh, m is closed under lambda sequences and this has um, like the existence of such a huge cardinal has higher consistency strengths than Wopenka's principle um, and Trevor used this like to show that we can actually have properties of uh, logics that have strength stronger than Wopenka's principle. And what he did, he actually used those class logics. Yeah. So he showed uh, kappa is huge at lambda is equivalent to, for all sentences, phi in this 
uh, well, first order logic that has additionally arbitrary disjunctions and universal quantifiers, um, like for sentences in that logic, we have to have that um, any sentence of phi of exactly size kappa has to have a su substructure B of exactly size kappa, which is also um, a model of phi. And this is equivalent to kappa being huge at lambda. Okay, and um, well, Boney did something like did the same. He also characterized huge cardinals, but um, in a very different way. He used something that, like, it's kind of a theory he developed, uh, the theory of compactness for type omission principles. Um, this is now a bit of a bit of a complicated uh, definition. So a logic L is said to have uh, lambda to the kappa. Comp uh, is said to be lambda to the kappa compact for type omission if given some theory t and a type p of x um, over l so this is a collection of l formulas in one free variable and we have that t can be written as um, the union of all s and lambda to the kappa of some theories ts and px can be written as a union of all s and lambda to the kappa of some types ps of x. Now, if for, well, lambda kappa club many s in lambda to the kappa, ts has a model omitting ps, then t is ought to have a model omitting p. Yeah. Um, yeah, while omitting some type ps means, so realizing a type Realizing this type px means um, there is a like a model realizes it, it if it has some element a such that for all formulas uh, in the type this uh, element satisfies the formula and it omits it if it has no uh, element that realizes it. Okay, um, so this is kind of similar to to compactness, right? We have like um, small bits of the theory that, uh, like, if we if we satisfy all bits of the theory, we satisfy the whole theory. Just we have this type that comes along with it, and um, we have that if we satisfy small bits of the theory while simultaneously omitting small bytes of the type, we get a model of the um, whole theory while simultaneously omitting the whole type. Could I interrupt and, for a moment? I have a question yes. about this definition. Yeah. I don't see any connection between the uh, the indices S and the corresponding theory and type. Uh, is T sub S, for instance, supposed to be an increasing function of S or something? Um, Otherwise, saying you have a club of S's doesn't seem to say very much at all about the corresponding T sub S's. Yeah, I mean, so, well, it, it just depends on, mm, how should I say this? I think it is right, right, that they should obey that relationship. The ordering for the they should have something like that because otherwise, I, I mean, like the thing is, the thing is, make T sub S empty for those, and put all the useful T sub S's on the non-stationary complement of that. Hmm. If I remember Will's the like similar definitions of this type, I think it does have the the ordering they do extend. Yeah, maybe that's right. Like what I'm thinking is, um, well, we can just kind of ignore the the non-useful ways how to express T as a as such a union. Do you know what I mean? Like those are not really relevant. Like the only the only um, the only kind of filtrations of T that we care about are the ones where 
where this like gives us some useful information. It seems to me that this is saying that if you have a theory and a type that can be written as unions, even in a completely silly way, then you still have to have this conclusion that from lambda club many t sub s's you get all of t. Well, and only if well, only if the t s have models omitting p s. Like I don't know, like a silly way would be to put all of t in one t s, right? But then this wouldn't tell us anything about whether whether this actually has a model. Yeah. So what? What I was thinking is take TSs of the sort that you're thinking of, reasonable ones, but just re-index them so they're indexed by a non-stationary set and make T sub S empty elsewhere. The empty theory will omit any type you want, so that's not a problem. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. No, Jonathan, I'm pretty sure that Will has that. Uh, assumption. I think he calls it increasingly filtered yeah. by lambda kappa or something like that. And that's just saying that they have to extend if S extends. Okay. Those have to. Because I just checked, like, I worked with this similar definition of his. So I'm pretty sure that that's. Yeah. yeah. Sounds, sounds reasonable to me. Yeah. Okay. So saying we add that, um, we want that like on this club, TS has a model emitting PS and then T has a model emitting P. And like this lambda kappa club is like some generalization that says, um, well, yeah, if, if X, um, yeah, is in this lambda kappa club, then X should be in U for any normal final order for the U on lambda as the kappa. And Will came up with some like nice condition that makes this work yeah um okay and then will what will was showing was that kappa suited lambda is equivalent to l kappa kappa uh, having this lambda kappa compactness for type omission and now given this and his own characterization of huge cardinals by those um yeah by those kind of somewhat levenheim skolem theorems of this logic um trevor asked whether we could do this with purely finitary logic, so with logic that don't have any infinary part at all. And um, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, and this is kind of what, what Will and me showed. Um, if you look at first order logic and augment it with a um, well-foundedness quantifier, which is like, it's like the semantics here. So A satisfies the formula qwf xy phi of xy if and only if well the formula phi defines some well-founded relation on a yeah and the theorem then says well kappa is huge at lambda if and only if um well this finitary logic with the well-foundedness quantifier has this lambda to the kappa compactness for a type omission okay and I guess I can show you the proof, like how you use this kind of, like how this type omission can be useful in a proof. Um, so first of all, it's rather easy to see that if you have, like we want to show that two implies one, yeah? So uh, we want to see that kappa is huge at lambda and it's rather easy to see that um, if you have some ordinal gamma larger than lambda, such that B gamma is closed on a kappa sequences, and there's um, an elementary embedding from B gamma into some N, such that it has critical point kappa, J of kappa equals lambda, and uh, the point where image of lambda is uh, an element of N. Then if we, um, for X, a subset of lambda to the kappa, say X is... Uh, in U, if and only if the point where the image of lambda is in J of X, and this defines an uh, ultra filter which uh, witnessing hugeness of kappa. Yeah. Um, so what we want is um, to get such a transitive N and such an elementary embedding that has those three properties. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's look at the following theory, um, um, which has the elementary diagram of the gamma in the logic with the well-foundedness quantifier. And then this part here says that, well, this um, element C has order type at least kappa, so uh, the interpretation of the constant C kappa um, has order type larger than kappa. Um, and then we add another constant D, and we say for every alpha smaller than kappa that C alpha has to be an element of this D. And we also say that the cardinality of D should be um, the interpretation of this constant C kappa. And now we, we add a type, which says, uh, which is the type of an element that um, is in D union C, so those two constants that we added, but is not equal to any of the um, of the constants C alpha for alpha smaller than lambda. Okay, and now if n is a model of T that is omitting P, then well, because of this well-foundedness quantifier, we can assume that n is well-founded, so we can look at the transitive collapse and assume that uh, n is transitive, and then. Well, the fun function that sends an element x of the gamma to the interpretation of the constant cx in n defines an elementary embedding from v gamma to n. Um, because of this element here with order type kappa that is below c kappa, so the critical point is at most kappa. Um, and because, well, the C alpha for alpha smaller than lambda are all in D, we have to have that the point where this image of lambda is uh, contained in Dn. Okay, now we want to see that the critical point is exactly kappa and that Dn is exactly this point-wise image here. So now, well, if the critical point of J would be alpha smaller than kappa, then alpha would actually realize this type because well, alpha would be um, like this This constant C here uh, has all type at least, this is an ordinal and has all type, type at least kappa. So if alpha is smaller than kappa, alpha would be contained in C. But if alpha is a critical point, then J of alpha is larger than alpha. So the constant C alpha would not be interpreted as alpha. Um, so this would show that alpha is in C, and at the same time, alpha would be unequal to all those uh, constants C alpha. So alpha would realize P, but N was a model that was omitting P, so there's a contradiction. So the critical point can't be below kappa. And similar, um, if the point where the image of lambda would be a proper subset of, of this set Dn, then, well, any model or uh, any any x that is in the n but not in the point where image would be an element of d but unequal to all the constants c alpha and again would realize p so this would also be a contradiction and then well n is a model of well you know that j of the point of image of lambda is um well is has size lambda and it thinks this is exactly uh, the this like yeah uh, it, it thinks d is this or d is this uh, point wise image and the cardinality of d was exactly uh, j of kappa by this part of the theory so lambda is j of kappa so we have all those three properties okay and then like I didn't show you how this this club looks. So, with some work, we can make uh, the gamma itself um, a model of small bits of the theory that omit this type. Uh, yeah, this is what I'm not going to show you now. Okay, some questions for the end. Um, first of all, we now saw like. Uh, this logic with a well foundness quantifier uh, having lambda kappa compactness for type omission gives you a huge cardinal. Um, 
Like one question is, can maybe first order logic alone give um, having this property give you already that kappa is due to lambda? There is a bit of a background to this question uh, because um, Magidor and Hayut showed that if you have if you don't index here by lambda to the kappa, but by um, well the subsets of lambdas size smaller than kappa, then this compactness for type omission for first order logic gives you a super compact cardinal. So the question is, can we kind of mimic this for, for the huge case? And we, we think we can mimic it if we if we um so if we substitute this here by the appropriate um set that an ultra filter witnessing two hugeness of uh of kappa. Um, so this type of compactness for type omission for first order logic, we think we can show from this that kappa is huge at lambda. But we don't get it from this huge assumption itself already. Um, okay, and then like other questions one could look at is, of course, kind of what are different, say, compactness or Han for ULST numbers of class logics that maybe lie between uh well first order logic with arbitrary conjunctions and extensive quantifiers and second order logic with those infinitary conjunctions and uh extensive quantifiers and kind of why this may be a bit hard is like notoriously those compactness numbers even in the finite case are already not known so um yeah but maybe it maybe it could be that uh this gets easier even like maybe yeah I don't know. I haven't. I haven't really. I'm. I'm kind of dropping those questions. I haven't really looked at them uh, too much myself. And um, we had this property that was um, of the logic that was equivalent to Schellachness that had kind of this bound of the size of models that they had to be smaller than kappa. Um, which was kind of an alternation of the usual weak compactness property and yeah i don't know i haven't really seen this uh, property anywhere else so one question one could ask is what are like other of these bounded weak compactness cardinals of logics maybe even of set presentable logics okay um i think that's it thank you jonathan thanks very much great talk i really enjoyed it um, questions from the audience? Can you go back to your question slide for a sec? Yes. So can you, is there an interesting logic like in between those two for the second question? Like I don't have a good intuition. Uh, I mean, like we could look at what we did about compactness of the Hertig quantifier and see whether like adding, for example, those infinitary conjunctions and existential quantifiers, as in the case of first order mm -hmm. and second order logic, doesn't change anything or something. Okay, like I see. Yeah, possible. because that's not... That would be my expectation in this case, actually. Yeah, I just need to think for a little bit like what's expressible with these infinitary uh, quantifiers. <laughs> Sorry, I'm... I'm struggling to talk. Okay, yeah, very interesting. I see. So that would be one of the possibilities. Okay, last chance. Any questions from the others? Okay, then Jonathan, thanks once again. Thank you.